Welcome to the Rebecca Panapinto Project. Today, I'm so excited to host a very dear friend named Val Henderson. She's a true Austin, Texas native who started her career with SHI Global. They're an IT solutions provider, and during her time there, Val was actually an inside sales rep, making about 60 cold calls a day. However, she now finds herself leading the revenue organization at Kalen, one of the fastest growing cloud native consulting companies within the AWS ecosystem. With a passion for growth and technological progress, Val joined Kalen to help their customers continue to imagine, engineer, and iterate across their technology stacks. Val is a builder and a lover of teams. She especially loves leading through change. And outside of work, Val lives for live music, travel, spending time with her husband, Ryan, their five-year-old son, Dylan, and their dog, Lucy. Enjoy the show. Val Henderson, how are you? I am so good. How are you? Fabulous. You look great. I'm so happy to have you on the show today. Thank you. You do too. I'm thrilled to be here. Awesome. Well, let's start out today chatting about something near and dear to, I think, both of our hearts. But I love it about you because I think when I first met you, it like stood out on your LinkedIn profile. And that's that you call yourself a cloud native advocate. What does that mean to Val Henderson? I am obsessed with the notion of being able to exploit the nature of the cloud. It is such an incredible asset and resource. And I am an advocate for cloud native because I believe that the cloud is there to use, to scale, to create resiliency, elasticity, all of the things that can make whatever you are building in the cloud more powerful. And to me, that's really exciting. And uh, an, an analogy that I often think about is in when you're you know working out or you're trying to get in shape, how do you think about using your all the things like do you want to just work out or do you want to get your food right and drink your water? Like it's the whole picture. And I think a lot of companies are, can be narrow in the way that they think about the cloud and the idea of being cloud native and exploiting it in a way. And that might sound kind of harsh, but that's really what it's about. It's there to take advantage. And all of the cloud platforms want companies to do that. And I think it takes, thinking about it, like you would think about taking care of your whole self in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. There used to be this term because we met when we were both at Rackspace and there was this term that was thrown around of helping customers understand the art of the possible. Yeah. And I think now at Kalent, you guys are doing that on an even greater scale. So what does that look like when you sit down with a customer and first like stretch their minds to be more (laughs) innovative and think of this art of the possible? Like, there's a little freak out moment, but then I think a lot of magic happens. Walk us through a little bit recent experience maybe you had doing that. I think a lot of the 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 human nature, I believe, is to stay comfortable. Now, many people I know don't live in that and are constantly pushing themselves and moving outside of that and growing. But by human nature, I think that that's really standard. So when you think about innovation, it's like, oh man, the art of the possible. Wow. But also like that means getting uncomfortable and potentially learning something new about yourself and or the technology or the capabilities. And it's really important to have that conversation and kind of understand where everybody is in terms of their willingness to get uncomfortable and take risk. And sometimes the business just doesn't allow it. It's maybe moving too fast there's too many, you know, requirements across the organization, whatever it might be. But the way that I like to think about it is uh, like a blank check, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And it's a, it's an actual, you know, business process. And we used to talk about this at my company SHI before I went of like, if money was no option, what would you do? And not in the sense of like, what would you do for a career, but what would you do with this specific business problem we're having or how, you know, whatever it might be. So I think in the context of the art of the possible, it's like, okay, what if money and time and you can back into the things it's like this in a perfect world, this is what we would do. And it's like, okay, well, let's work backwards. And it's a multi-step process. It doesn't happen overnight. And I find the companies that really are willing to just take some risk and get uncomfortable and trust 
us also and know that whatever we're doing is in their best interest. Ultimately in a consulting organization, like we're only as good as our customer experience and we're not selling a product, right? We're selling an outcome and we're selling a deliverable. So I I want them to understand that and know that we don't, we're not successful unless, you know, they're happy and successful and it's a really great experience. Yeah, that's good. Another thing that I remember everybody used to say that sticks out in my mind too is do with, not do for. And yes. helping teams understand how to collaborate and like build something together. Because again, you are selling outcomes. You're selling people. It's not like just click a button and it works. So yeah. you have to get people around this culture and this idea of do with, not do for. How yes. do you, for risk adverse people, encourage that type of collaboration though? Yeah, I actually feel like the the do with can help significantly because we have people on our team that have seen what's possible when you have the right leadership from the top, the right resources, the right thought process. So I think just building that trust and meeting people where they are and respecting that. But I think little by little when in the do with model, we're able to gain trust and maybe take a step a little bit outside of maybe what that customer said, like just it's straightforward. If we see a, a means that there could be a better way or a more modern way, right? It's technology is constantly changing. And so a client might say, well, this is what I know works and I've seen it work and I feel comfortable. And we're like, that will work, but there's a way that is in our opinion, better because of efficiencies, time. I mean, time is just like the most valuable asset. And I'm always thinking about how can they save their internal customers time, external customers time. Like everybody is just trying to find that balance. So I, again, feel like the do with model is perfect for building trust to like push a little bit, like, cause we end mm-hmm. up having to do that. And yeah. I think that that's okay. Yeah. If you don't have rapport, then that definitely is never going to fly with these folks. So by building that early on, I mean, yeah, and credibility for sure. Yeah. E- even from what I remember, it's early on in just the relationship building sales process that there's these efforts to show that this is a collaboration. We need your buy-in as much as our buy-in is to actually make you successful. It's really critical. It's critical. The whole process of working with a customer as they're trying to build something or move something or optimize something is from conversation one through delivering said outcome, there's many points of failure. Mm -hmm. And being thoughtful about the process and the handoffs and the experience and the communication, all of that stuff is something that we're really prideful about at Kalen. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we have a delivery methodology that thinks through those points of failure. Um, But you're correct. Like it doesn't, you know, nobody in delivery is involved in that first conversation, but that first conversation sets the stage. And if we do a poor job in understanding the dynamics, the needs, the priorities, the timelines, like no one is set up for success. Oh, I agree. Yeah. So at Kalent, you're building a ton of really cool things, a ton of really cool customers. Does one or two projects stick out in your mind of the most exciting, uh, maybe the, the most challenging? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. We get to work on a lot of really cool things. It's part of our recruitment efforts, right? As yeah. And so many engineers have a lot of options and architects have a lot of options right now, but we want to be a place that they can come and get to work on really interesting, cool stuff. This uh, is something that I am like trying to change the stigma on, but we work with a company called Allergan, which they are the providers of Botox. Um, I use Botox. I am uh, vain enough to say that I like it. It's preventive. I don't like wrinkles. So I'm a consumer and they have uh, what we call like Allergan data labs, which is a subset within the company. And that company is all about how they can use AI machine learning data to improve the experience for their customers. And 
they do something called Botox Day and actually being able to execute on that, which is across the org. They have different applications that are all connected. They turn to us to help them. And I think from my perspective, why it's been so cool is just that we've been able to help them really adopt a microservices architecture and all these different best practices that they're going to be able to take on outside of, you know, Botox day or the different things that we're helping them do. We want to be an extension of their team. And I think they would say that we are, this is a long-term ongoing relationship and we love getting to do that as much as we love getting to help a customer, you know, optimize or refactor an application. It's cool just to be help a customer build these processes that are going to be applicable across their business. So that's one thing that I think has been really interesting for me is being able to see what is possible when you do with. And mm-hmm. our team starts seeing more opportunity and their team sees more opportunity and it continues to to grow, which is really exciting. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. It reminds me of a project that we got to work at. Uh, in previous life as well, which was with Colgate. And yes. I had Latanya on the show. And oh, you did. You know, oh, I she was that. amazing. Yes. Um, and basically, they were building a dream that they had this hum toothbrush that they really were like, hey, we have a vision, we have an idea, we know how devices work, but we need to have the cloud and data working for us to actually make this market ready. And hand in hand, help build that and bring to life this now everywhere toothbrush. I mean, I use on myself. We're just so by cool. a really fun do with yeah relationship, and um, that was just a really cool project. I'll never forget. And um, just building those relationships within Colgate too. Those are all just really impressive people that are actually making some cool stuff happen. Doing cool stuff. I think the other thing that we have here at Keelan, which has been amazing, is we work with Andreessen Horowitz, which. Oh, yeah. Obviously, they're backing some of the most, you know, exciting and cool companies on the planet, which is really fun. And being able to be a company that they turn to in terms of our level of expertise specific to modernization efforts. But we had a company run the world Mm -hmm. that basically came to us on a Friday morning. And all that they do is basically support organizations to help with meetings. And... In the virtual world during COVID, it was like they were getting obviously hit up all the time and they came to us and they basically had a production outage. And within three hours of this call, our team was able to triage and remediate remediate the situation, which was basically just a misconfiguration of some of the services. And Hmm. we were able to get them back online that day, which to me, I'm like, that is the spirit and our DNA of what we do. And I just am very passionate about being able to help customers and Mm -hmm. some have the art of the possible and this big, Hey, we want to do all of these things across a, you know, a big company like Allergan, which you get, it's a long-term you get to work. And some are like, Hey, we have something we need done like in the next, you know, 10 minutes. Um, And I like both. I think both are really fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something you've mentioned in the past too is yeah. one of your favorite things is scaling a sales organization, <laughs> which to me sounds daunting because I am an IC individual contributor. I just kind of want to worry about my number, my customers, and do that. But you see this global vision for a sales yeah. team all over the US making it happen for Kaylin. Tell me a little bit more like where that passion came from and maybe what the special sauce is to really helping companies scale their sales org. Yes. I also, it's funny hearing some of the things you're saying. I'm like, it's one of those things that you're like, I guess I do say that I like doing that. It's really, it's a hard thing to do. I would say I realized I liked it when I started doing it, frankly, right? Like I was a direct manager and had a team of 12 and that was great. And then I got promoted and had a, you know, different managers underneath me and each of them had teams. And I liked that. I just liked it. And I, you know what I liked? I liked the impact and I liked the ability to drive consistency. And Mm. what I saw is this idea of non-negotiables, which I'm super passionate about because it's not a long list, but the things that are really important about how you go to market and the customer experience and how you show up. But 
scale is fun. And I think many people are looking for how you scale. And what I have found is just asking yourself, does this scale? And sometimes the answer is yes, but at this point it won't or just flat out no. And so anytime we make a decision here at Kaylin or in previous lives, I'd be like, does this scale? Like when will it hit that critical point where it doesn't? And can it be solved by people, process, tools? Like it's the same thing our customers think about, right? And I like running large organizations because of the impact and the ability to see those things and if they're working and if they're not working. And I think the bigger the organization, the easier it is to pull data and see trends, right? You're able to be like, yeah. that's not working or wow, we're having an incredible amount of success here. So I love that. And ultimately, I love people. I love people for their good things, their bad things, their weirdnesses, their neuroses. Like what I've learned over time is just like accepting people as they are. My grandmother always used to say like, start with weird. Like all people are ultimately like a little odd. Like everybody's got their thing. And she would always say, start there and like, learn like about that, about somebody and something that you're like, oh, I don't do that but why do you do it? Right. That's cool. And I love it. I will say hands down. It's my favorite part about this business. I get to engage with people. I would never get to engage with just walking around, you know, in Austin, Texas in my life. And that's pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. But I will say you've picked the two areas that are probably the hardest to scale services and salespeople. <laughs> <laughs> so kudos to you for taking on a big job. Blood um, for punishment, I think. Yeah, oh, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. But no, I agree. I call it finding what people makes people tick. And it's yeah. ultimately they're weird because it's the yeah. only way to make people motivated and intrigued to buy into whatever it is you need them to do in the context of whatever you're trying to scale. Yes. And just honoring that about somebody, right? I think it's also very rare you get to change people, right? I think I feel honored to have the opportunity to like coach and provide feedback and mentorship, but it's really hard to change. It takes a lot of repetitive behavior. And I have seen people evolve, but I don't ever really think about like, oh, I want to change this person. I'm like, how do I enhance what's amazing and help them kind of understand where they have gaps and just have the self-awareness about it and tell them like, raise your hand and ask for help in those areas. Like there is somebody who the thing you hate and you feel uncomfortable with somebody else loves, like they love it. I'm like, go find that person. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I like it. Another thing I learned from you that you love is this term measuring what matters. And I'm reminded of the book before beer email. Does that still exist? <laughs> Yeah, the, yes. it's like traveled across so many companies. Yeah, <laughs> I think I it's great. It. Yeah, no, it is. I think it's it's. I'm glad to hear many people hate it. Very few love it, but ultimately, I think everybody respects the fact that it works. Um, and I cannot take ownership of creating it. Uh, a leader yeah. that I worked with in the past came up with it, and. Um, I actually will give him a shout out because he's an employee yeah. at Zoom. His name's Brian Fritz. He's actually my son's godfather. Like he's a good friend now, but he came up with it. And what okay. we found was just having people, A, think about what they wanted to accomplish on a weekly basis and then what happened and why certain things happened and why certain things didn't and was a really good exercise. I still do it. I like, I'm, I write down at the beginning of the week, I'm like, what are the critical big rocks, little things? What's going to stand in my way? What are, who do I, you know, all of those things. So yeah, I just find if you're not measuring and there's no accountability, like often it just does not happen. Mm -hmm. No, I'm with you. And I loved that. I always was able to throw like a little personality into it. And the conversation started for my one-on-ones and there yeah. was a starting point and a, an accountability point, like you said, and it's like if something slipped or something missed, it's like, man, okay, we found a problem yeah. area. But it wasn't ever like there was going to be punishment or consequence for it. It was like, cool, how do we solve this together? Yes. And also like the very, a very important part of that was like, where do you need help? And I found like often when I would have those conversations and a salesperson would come in and 
there were roadblocks that needed to be removed. And I do believe you gain a lot of credibility as a leader of helping your team understand what is critical, what isn't. And then when things are blocked, removing those blockers, which is, you know, takes work. It does. I think that that's probably as a, as a frontline leader, what you spend a lot of time doing. And there are days where you're like, why am I doing this? But I think it's, it can be really rewarding too, when you see the results of, you know, your team's success. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like though, when it comes to this measuring and like the before beer email format, that can be very um, black and white because it relates to sales. It's like, is this going to close? Is this not? How many meetings do I have? Things like that. But you have another passion around the health of the business being around net promoter scores and having those checks and balances. But how does that scale? Because so much of once you get to the bigger org or a project that's outcome driven, it's not black or white. Correct. How do you really adjust to that situation? Yeah. I'll be honest. I'll let you know when I figure it out. I like, I just recently took uh, ownership of customer success here at Kalen and we're literally asking ourselves that question right now. We have a great MPS score of 9.4 out of 10. And that's a lot of pressure though, too, right? We have really high standards. Uh, Our customers are wonderful and have seen a lot of value, but the the larger the customer base and the longer you're around and the growth, like how do you keep standards at that level? And then to your point, it's like, how do you scale that organization? I will say there's a lot of great tools now to help with a lot of that. Like customer success is not a side thing for a lot of companies. It's uh, the thing. And you have so many incredible platforms to help with that. But you also, you see a lot of like chief customer officer, chief experience officer. There's so many options for all things. Think about if you're just like, oh, you know, what toothpaste am I going to go buy? Right. I mean, you've got 50 different options. So you have to bring it when you're talking about customer experience. If the customer does not feel like incredible engaging with you and your team, like they can go somewhere else. So right now we're thinking about that. Like how does our customer experience tailor to the customer scale and wow them? And in a services business, because of all the points of failure and differences and things, it's it can be challenging, but we're working through it. And I'm just proud of us. A lot of companies do not take it as seriously or have people own it. And we are constantly trying to get better. I just had a conversation with our CEO JP about this and it's cool. We're investing and he wants to continue to invest and double down in that space. And we're going to. That's good. Yeah. I would say it probably ties pretty closely to what you're talking about earlier too, which is your people and your talent and keeping them engaged on exciting projects. Yeah. I mean, obviously you don't have a a technology that's archaic or too legacy that you're having to convince people to like <laughs> code again and something that they learn in college. AWS is sexy. Amazon is, you know, innovating, but still these people have tons of options. And I mean, I've seen competitors just pluck each other left and right. Right. No, they do. Um, I would tell you a couple of things. So and I, Ginger, who you know, who's our yes. COO and uh, sits over all of delivery, is very passionate about retention and her organization's experience. So, regardless of you know if this is a reoccurring project or you know a couple of months, we're wanting one delivery organization and the ability to have people move and evolve and also have really cl- clear career pathing and. I think that is exciting. What I found is many engineers are like, how can I learn more, work on cool stuff, do different things. But they're also engineers that are like, I'm happy doing this thing. And I want to do this and I want to do it over and over again. And we're building a platform to ingest that data about who these people are and do really incredible reviews that are 360, which I will tell you, I have worked for big companies and none of them have done a process that is as 
um, specific and thoughtful about each individual and not just them and how they see themselves, but how their leader sees them and their peers and taking all of that data and making sure that we're thoughtful about each person. We're really, we're hundred percent remote as well, which I think right now has been a valued thing. Uh, I think they like the idea of having this flexibility. Um, we've offered some cool programs about paying people in, you know, Bitcoin, which is unique because we've got international um, people that are on our team. And sometimes that can be more stable than, you know, local currencies. We want to hear our people too. We are committed to doing a monthly town hall where the end of the town hall, which is about 15 minutes is anybody can ask any question and it can be anonymous, which I've had town halls for years, but always in person. And the person who's asking the question is raising their hand in front of 500, a thousand people. It's like, are people really going to ask the tough questions if they're going to be no, right? I don't think so. I mean, I've just had enough experience feeling like they don't. So this is an opportunity people can ask the tough questions and all of the feedback we take and we try to correct before the next town hall So we're trying to build a culture that is about listening and acting and creating the best possible place they could ever work because they're helping build it. And I think that's unique. Um, But it's competitive. And ultimately, I would just say, like, what worked before does not work now. And if companies are still trying to do the same thing to keep talent, it's not going to work. And yeah. I'm also very passionate about diversity of our talent and measuring that. And I think a diverse population of talent helps with retention because there's different ideas. There are different experiences. The feeling of inclusion can be really powerful, especially in a virtual world, right? Like that connection can be harder to create, but if you have an inclusive environment, I think it's easier. So but we're always learning. And I would say everybody on our team is always asking the question of like, what could we be doing? We're measuring it. We're looking at it every month, like from an attrition and talent and that matters. But man, I read a lot about what companies are doing and, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot that there's a lot to do and, mm-hmm. you know, we want to do more. I think one idea that sticks out my mind not just for millennials, because we all get pegged as <laughs> greedy and demanding, but everyone wants skin in the game. They want, yes. you know, f- to feel like they're actually part of the machine and that, you know, not that everything's going to break down if they're not there, but that they are part of the puzzle and that it doesn't work the same way if they're not a part of it. I totally agree. Purpose, mm-hmm. impact, being heard. Mm-hmm all of that. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, yeah. I feel that way. I am, I guess I'm, I'm an elder millennial, I guess, by the standards of where they draw the lines, but mm-hmm. I think Gen Z for what it's worth is going to push even harder in that mm-hmm. area. Yeah. And I see it in young candidates and it's cool and they want that. I mean, they have good ideas and they want to be heard. And I think there's an opportunity to really listen and create a safe environment to share. Yeah. And that to me is one of the non-negotiables of like psychological safety at work. Um, I have worked in all different types of environments. And what I have found is when people feel supported and the freedom and the openness to be themselves and to share, you get better output. And yeah, maybe there are times when you have to create boundaries or you have to tell somebody like that's not possible and here's why. I'm not saying you say yes to everything, but you want people to be able to ask. Mm. Yeah. yeah. No, I totally agree. I want to switch gears now a little bit yeah. to okay. uh, Val's purpose and fulfillment and vision. Yeah. And uh, I mean, just what you do to be like on the top of your game, I think is super impressive because you've got a little guy married, got you know a company to run. Um, but t- talk us through a little bit of, the health and wellness parts of your life. I know meditation is big, but what are some of those things you're really intentional about maybe morning, evening, throughout the day to put you at your best every day when you're showing up? Yeah. 
I, some, I read a quote a long time ago and I'm really embarrassed. I can't remember who said it, but I, I remember the words that was like, you can't show up for other people. If you're not showing up for yourself, I am notoriously a people pleaser and a perfectionist and not the good type of perfectionist, the perfectionist that is like constantly like I suck and everything I do is not good enough, which the more I'm learning about that, like, I think in a lot of ways has fueled my like go do keep going, get better. So it's this dance for me of, uh, how much of that do I let in and how much of it do I not let in? And that is something that I think is people are more open to talking about mental health now, which I am very happy about. I think it always should be freely discussed. I used to laugh because Um, I, when I ran a team in NorCal, I would go to therapy once a week and I would say I had it on the, it was at five 30 and I would leave the office those days at five, which was unique. I typically would stay late. And my, my team knew I was like, and everybody kind of acted weird. And I'm like, I have insurance. You all have insurance. It's helping me. I'm a better leader to you. You guys should, somebody should be driving me there. Actually. One of you should be driving me. So (laughs) I think for me, that is really critical. And taking care of myself so I can be a better leader, a better, you know, employee and a better partner to our customers and to AWS and meditation is important. Um, I am a fan of transcendental meditation, which is kind of a twice daily thing. And it's one of those things that people, it sounds like woo woo. It's not, it's like, there's a structure. It's pretty easy. Um, I am a big fan of it and it's, you know, all over the country. It's super easy to learn how to do it. Getting enough sleep. Like I am not one of those people that's like, I can do three, four hours. Like, no, I cannot. I need like seven is not great, which is what I most, I get a lot of days and ideally it's eight drinking water, which I will literally go a whole day and just drink like a pot of coffee. So I've had to remember like you got to drink water and then exercise like non-negotiable like four or five times a week. Otherwise I just get cranky and I'm not a good partner, mom, leader, and none of those things. But man, it's, I like say all that. And then you start thinking about like, okay, but then you've got, you know, you're traveling and you're doing this and COVID and somebody in your kid's class got sick and now they're home for five days. And the reality is it ebbs and it flows. And there are quarters or months where I'm like, man, I'm in the flow. I'm getting it done. And then like something knocks me off and I have, you know, a couple of weeks where it's kind of painful and then you get back up and you do it again. And I just don't think life is static. And I know that there's people out there that are like insanely disciplined and just blinders and like they do their things every day. I am not one of those people. And I think the better, the more, you know, yourself, the better. And so I've kind of figured out like, that's my rhythm and I'm okay with it. And what happens now when I have the weeks where I'm like going and traveling and I'm not able to commit to all of the things that I like to do where I feel my best, I just know it's going to pass. I'm like, yeah, "Yeah, I've got a couple of weeks of this and it's going to be fine. And then I will also say I've created a boundary at work where I don't get a lot of time with my kiddo. And so I just block the time on my calendar and my team and my boss and my peers all respect it. Not once. I mean, and occasionally they'll say like, Hey Val, this is during this time. Like, can you make it no pressure if you can't? And I turn some of those down and some of them I attend because I can, or my husband can, you know, hang out, but that is, uh, that is advice I got from somebody or in my career and it works and nobody thinks less of you. And if they do, who cares? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I just am kind of like, you have to let go of that. I do think the older you get, the less you do care about what other people think. And I've always kind of felt like I wanted to be that, you know, 85 year old woman wearing like sequins to the, you know, seven yes. eleven. I, I really do. I'm like, that's who I want to be. So I'm always kind of embodying of like, just, you know, care less about other, the way, you know, what other people think. So. Yeah, no, that's good. I think when you line up your priorities and you stick with them, it's really easy to make decisions. It's when those aren't secure that all of a sudden you wobble or 
it is. And for me, like the perfectionism kicks in and I start beating myself up and that's only more detrimental. It's like, okay, you can miss a workout and it's not the end of the world. It's okay. Totally. And that's why I'm like, that has helped when I'm like, oh, I kind of just now know my cycle. And like, I do like to stack up travel in a certain way. And it's just, you know, it's never perfect. And you just kind of have to be like, Hey, it's part of the journey. Lean Mm -hmm. into it. You're going to miss a workout. You're maybe going to be a little tired. Like it's not the end of the world. Like it's okay. So, but I do will tell you, Rebecca, I'm very, I'm in awe of those people that are just like committed to their routine and just never waver. Those people I'm like amazing. Just, it's oh, they not- don't have kids. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> like me. That although I still don't stay with my, my discipline that well either. Sometimes. Yeah. It's hard. It's so hard. No, I know. The biggest thing for me in helping to really get like the perfectionism under control too was travel because there are so, and COVID travel is like that times two because you have no choice but to have to go with the flow and like I can't make that meeting. My flight's four hours delayed. And you learn how to manage that and a lot of self awareness too of how I react in the situation. What are triggers? How can I stay in control? Yes. It's crazy. It is with COVID. It has like the travel. I see it triggers everybody. I think like I watch people and it's heightened and you see more people kind of like squabble with each other. It's kind of an interesting situation. I will tell you this whole experience for me has given me a ton of empathy for just everybody's experiences because it brought home into the work environment in a way that I hadn't experienced before. Like I always want to know about people's lives, but it was different. It was a different level of intimacy. And so now I'm like, I just kind of am like, you never know. You just don't know. And I have to assume everybody's dealing with their own things. Yeah. 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 I love it. Well, you're so encouraging. I want to now hear from you. We talked a little bit about principles in and out, but yeah. um, I'm hoping you have one that has been really kind of your North star and the core yeah. principle that's helped you be successful in business. What would you say that is? I have always said this and I've never wavered. It's authenticity. And I feel like that's encompassing of, you know, integrity and honesty and, you know, openness and some level of vulnerability. Um, I feel like the older I get and the more experience I have, the more important it is to me too. I think you start really seeing the things that you value and you really get clear on like things that you don't. And I value that in my interactions with people, but I also value it in leaders that I work with and peers that I work with. I think it's super important to me. And I had somebody say in a a leadership coach that I had, Mm -hmm. who was great, was like people who are really strongly principled and authenticity can sometimes be suspect of people's motives. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I thought about how I show up and I'm like, yeah, but I've started, I turned that on its head a little bit. I'm like, I'm not suspect. I'm curious. And Mm -hmm. like I said, I love all people. I want to understand how people work, why they work the way they do, how they tick. But if you're authentic to you and to the, your customers and to the mission, and I believe you can be successful and fulfilled. And I do think those two things are not always together, right? You can be looked at as being highly successful. And then when you peel back the onion, that person feels sad right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like authenticity for me is like that line of like, when I'm true to that, I'm able to drive results and success and production, but I'm also content and happy and at peace. And that's ultimately what I'm after. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're such a joy. Thanks Val for coming on the show. You are a joy too. I love that you're doing this. Thank you for having me. I so appreciate it. I love watching all of these interviews. There's just so much great perspective out there. So keep doing it. Absolutely. All my people. I love showing up. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. Have a great rest of your week. We'll talk soon, Val. Okay. Thank you. 